Gold drops as the Fed warns there's another rate hike in the air. Iron ore is at a five-month high. Brent crude eyes off triple-digit prices and uranium bulls unite. I am Shay Russell and welcome back to Cocktails and Commodities, the resource podcast where macro analysis meets mining insights. Give us a like and tell your friends, but please remember all information in this podcast is general in nature and not financial advice. It didn't matter which pocket of the investment web I crawled into this week, as almost all of them were asking the same thing. Have I missed the uranium bull market? Absolutely not. We'll get to why it's only just getting started later. First, let's check in on what the shiny stuff is doing. Stronger for longer seems to be the phrase that best describes the September Federal Open Markets Committee. The Fed skipped a rate hike this month but left the door open for another rate hike later this year. Given there is only two meetings left, the next change will be in either November or December. While many have speculated the Fed will begin to cut rates in March 2024, the mothership of of all central banks said there would be no rate cuts until at least June 2024. In the lead-up to the Fed meeting, spot gold was fairly muted, trudging along the $1,930 US dollars per ounce level, give or take a few bucks. Gold dropped to 1921 on the news the Fed held rates, but it did get kicked as low as 1915 during the week. In short, stronger for longer will keep a lid on any major gold price gains for now. Though it won't take much for gold sentiment to swing to the downside, making 1904 an important level once again, but it's unlikely that gold will fall too far below it. The gold price may be down, but Asian bar demand is picking up. Nick Frappel, ABC Refineries Institutional Head of Global Markets, recently said that demand for kilo bars is increasing with what looks like restocking playing out in places like Singapore and Hong Kong. Demand throughout the rest of the Asian market remains patchy. You take your eyes off the market for one minute and iron ore is suddenly at 124 US dollars per tonne. So what happened? Steel production in China was stronger over July. Chinese credit growth climbed 9% year on year for August, giving China the first month on month growth since March this year. And as Daniel Hines, senior commodity strategist who writes the ANZ Commodities Wrap Notes, Chinese steel mills are possibly also restocking ahead of October's national holiday week, which runs from the 29th of September to the 6th of October. Of course, Another factor pushing iron ore up above 120 US dollars per tonne is good old fashioned speculation the Chinese government will do more to support the country's property market. Fueling the stimulus fairy tale this week was news three cities in China removed home purchase restrictions to support local property prices. This comes after the People's Bank of China cut rate by 25 basis points last week. Given iron ore is now up 20% in the past 30 days, and at a five-month high. Are these high prices likely to stick? Probably not, say strategists at Westpac, Commonwealth and ANZ, with all three banks predicting iron ore will be back under 100 US dollars per tonne by the end of the year. Does filling up the petrol tank hurt? That pain isn't going anywhere anytime soon. OPEC members Saudi Arabia and Russia have both extended the July and August production cuts for the rest of the year. The Saudi energy minister claims that this is to stabilise the oil price and is denying that it's about boosting oil revenues. Since reducing production, these two countries have cut 125 million barrels of crude from the market. And if this is extended into December at the current rate, that's another 120 million barrels out of production making it a total of 256 million barrels of crude removed from the market in just six months. The International Energy Agency believes there will be a significant drawdown in inventories in the coming months, which will put more pressure on oil prices. Though the Saudi energy minister isn't convinced the IEA's shortage will emerge. The minister said, based on their data, the jury is still out on if Chinese demand will really pick up. And according to them, the European manufacturing slump is likely to take pressure off demand as well. All of this information has caused Brent crude to trade upwards to 94 US dollars per barrel this week, a 12% gain since the start of September, and it's taken crude to a 10-month high. 
ANZ analysts warn prices will spike higher again. And Swedish bank Seb says only noise is needed to bring oil above 100 US dollars per barrel from here. Citigroup, while not backing down from their extremely bearish forecast, shared on this podcast on the 14th of August, agrees it's highly likely oil will reach 100 US dollars per barrel in the short term, but they say prices above 90 US dollars are unsustainable and they don't expect them to remain there for long. Citigroup is still the only firm with a bearish view on oil. As for Australians, petrol prices are going to be high for a while. For starters, it takes anywhere from two to four weeks for the oil price to be felt at the pump. Oil prices really only pushed through 90 US dollars per barrel seven days ago, so the higher price is yet to hit our wallets. Plus, the Aussie dollar weakness is set to drag on with no real catalyst to nudge the Aussie back up north. Diesel users, the news is even worse for you. There is still a global diesel refinery shortage after several refineries shut down during COVID. Diesel refining margins have increased as well, and coupled with crude production cuts, diesel prices are going to stay higher for some time. Once again, there's nothing like a few strong up days to draw attention to a highly contentious commodity. Uranium is back in the headlines and news of its rapid rise is filling up my inbox. Uranium spot price moves have caught some off guard and given the massive gain in some uranium stocks, several people have asked if they've missed the uranium bull market. Consider this for example. The uranium spot price has jumped from 54 US dollars a pound to 65 US dollars a pound, a solid 20% jump since the start of August. Yet in that same time frame, uranium stocks have leapt even higher. When you've got ASX-listed stocks such as Aurora Energy up 50% and Alligator Resources up 55% in just six weeks, it's natural to wonder if all the gains have happened and the uranium excitement is over. The short answer is no, you haven't missed this uranium bull market. In fact, this yellow cake bull market is just getting started and I'd argue that the September rally is really just a taste of what's to come. You see, what's happening in the uranium spot market is a small fraction of what plays out in the contract market. Back in June, I interviewed Andrew Vigor from Terra Uranium about the basics of the metal. And my first question was about the spot and contract price. What are they and which is the most important one to follow? Here's a clip from back then. It was pointed out in a podcast with Rick Rule just recently. There is a big difference between the uranium spot market and the uranium contract market. Now, the uranium spot price market has been moving up in recent months, but it could be a different story unfolding in the uranium contract market. Now, are you able to explain, you know, just a surface level for our new listeners to uranium, what these two things are and what are the differences in price, price movements here? Yeah, and thanks very much, Shay. I think a lot of people coming into uh, investing in uranium don't understand that it's it's actually a very very highly regulated business. Um, obviously, there's there's nuclear weapons involved, uh, so that the the whole trading and marketing of the uranium product uh, and its conversion and enrichment is very tightly controlled by a very few number of countries in the world. Uh, the major producers are uh, Australia, uh, Canada and uh, Kazakhstan, uh, and they're the three, by far the three biggest, and there's a fair bit comes out of Namibia and Africa as well. And it goes through a number of steps uh, in the enrichment process and then conversion into fuel rods for, for nuclear power stations. So the prices that people pay, uh, although there is now a spot market, um, there's always been a spot market, but it was so small that nobody really took any notice of it. Uh, and it's probably you'd be lucky if it was 15% of the total traded uh, uranium in the world. The, the, by far, the majority of it is traded through long-term contracts. And, and the long-term contracts are, are between the uh, energy utilities, in other words, the guys who run the power stations, the nuclear power stations, and uh, the, uh, the, the uh, constructors or the, the uh, guys who make the fuel rods for those stations, who then contract uh, the converters, who then contract the suppliers at the other end. There, there are very few vertically integrated companies. Uh, I guess Cameco in Canada would be one. And of course, the, the Russians, uh, Rosatom, uh, that, that's, that's a totally integrated uh, group as well. Uh, and perhaps some of the Chinese. Uh, but generally speaking, the, the producers uh, are contracting through a quite a complicated long process to sell their product. 
and that's generally done on a long-term uh, contract. The reason is pretty simple, is that uh, as, a, as a power company, uh, they would like to have secure supply for their reactors on a long-term basis. So they're looking at maybe five or 10 years in the future. A, a long-term contract is generally for delivery in three years' time or, or beyond. And, and most of the contracting, probably 80%, is done on those sorts of contracts, whereas the spot market is not actually today. It's less than three months. So it, it's that, that in the uranium business is right now. That's instantaneous if, if it's less than three months. Um, and, of course, with, with the uh, Sprott uh, Uranium Trust coming onto the market about a year and a half ago that and, and buying up basically everything that was on the spot market, uh, we're seeing spot prices now moving quite dramatically. They've probably been going up around a uh, dollar a week or so over the last couple of months, and, and they're just nudging up now towards $60 a pound. And, and generally accepted that $60 a pound is a pretty important number because that's where you start to have a, a number of the uh, dormant resources or the ones that have, uh, or restarts of, of, of uh, mothballed operations, they start to become economic around 60. But, but I think most people would accept 70 or 80 as a better price. And, th- and that's when we'll see a major lift in, in production. It, it's still pretty quiet at the moment at 60. And of course, the US Congress uh, have now brought in a reserve fund in the US uh, the, the U.S. Strategic Reserve, which they didn't have, which is surprising, uh, considering they have such a large nuclear industry. <laughs> yes. The U.S. still still produces almost 20% of their power from nuclear, nuclear energy. Uh, they did not have a strategic reserve, so they do now, and that, that fund is well-funded uh, and, is, and is entering into the spot market to uh, also start buying material into that fund. And that has a minimum price of $50, $50 a pound. So as soon as that was announced, which was about three, four months ago, it came into effect. Uh, we've seen uh, the every time the your spot prices come down a little, it, it's bounced off that fifty dollar mark. So that's a that's a really good floor now. As Andrew pointed out, sixty US bucks a pound is really just the start, and we can look forward to seeing the spot price rally up to seventy five or even eighty US dollars per pound in the months ahead. To boot, the price you and I see quoted each day misses what's happening with company-to-company contracts, and that's where the real excitement is pushing the uranium price higher. Now, this is where we turn to Uranium Insider, as he's known on Twitter. According to Justin Hun, the man behind the Twitter handle Uranium Insider, right now, uranium isn't a demand story, it's a supply story. As Justin noted in a recent video, It's a quirk of the legacy utility contracts with uranium miners that is crippling supply. All these utility power companies are gobbling up as much uranium as they can at a low price. So much so that Justin says uranium producers are sold out of material for the next three to four years as the end buyers, the power companies, have voluntarily chosen to receive more material thanks to these contracts. Four to five years ago, when some of these deals were struck, Uranium producers would throw in a flexible delivery provision to essentially sweeten the deal at a fixed price. That is, if a power company desired, they could buy an extra 20% of material at any time for the fixed price agreed in the contract. Now, many of these legacy contracts were made when the uranium price was hovering around 30 to 40 US dollars per pound. So when the uranium price is rising, Power companies exercise that flexible clause and scoop up extra supply at the historic rate rather than paying market rates. In doing so, they've locked up most of the uranium supply for the next few years. This comes at a time that there is already a deficit of production. We consume 180 million pounds of uranium globally, but only 125 million pounds are produced each year. Plus, there's another 55 new reactors to come online between now and 2026, which are going to need more uranium in the long term. Granted, most power companies lock in supply well before a new nuclear plant fires up. But the tightening of the uranium market is happening just as many countries are becoming friendly to the idea of nuclear energy. As Uranium Insider pointed out, future supply by power companies is being locked up. This is the sort of dynamic uranium bulls have been looking for for years. Governments changing their tune, a tight market, 
and an increase in uranium consumption. This kind of setup could favor near-term producers. Keep your eye on companies such as Lotus Resources, for example. This company is in the process of bringing their African project back online, and it looks like it could be happening at just the right time. The uranium trade isn't done, it's only just beginning. I really wanted to cover a bit more about the uranium basics today, talk about the geology as well as the changing political sentiment around this form of energy, but I had to cut nearly 2,000 words out of this script in order to keep it under 15 minutes. But make sure you're following so we can get into some of the basics next week. That's all for this episode of Cocktails and Commodities. Stick around for next week so you always know what rocks are making news, which commodities are moving markets, and the company's trying to get it out of the ground.